All right, thank you so much for joining us today for session one of our series, Reducing Reliance on Pesticides. This is a two-part series that we're offering to affiliates of B-City and B-Campus to examine chemical-centric pest management practices and to consider strategies for reducing pesticide use on city and campus lands. This morning, Sharon Salvaggio, Pesticide Program Specialist at the Xerces Society, will share a presentation titled Reducing Reliance on Pesticides Through Integrated Pest and Pollinator Management and Community Initiatives. And next Wednesday at the same time, we'll be hosting session two, which is a practitioner series offering model integrated pest management programs for B City and B Campus affiliates. So if you're not already registered for that one, you can go to the events page on either the BCD or the Xerces website and register for that. If you'd like to use closed captioning during today's presentation, you can access that through the Zoom mem um, menu bar, which should be probably at the bottom of your screen. And following today's presentation, we'll have time for Q&A. So feel free to put your questions in the Q&A feed also in that menu bar throughout the presentation today, and hopefully we'll get to everybody's questions at the end. So with that, I'm excited to hand it over to Xerces Pesticide Program Specialist, Sharon Salvaggio. Hi, everybody. Can y'all hear me? I'm, I'm assuming so. <laughs> um, well, thank you for making time for this. I always find it really gratifying to work with B cities and B campuses. Um, you all exhibit really a depth of passion for pollinator conservation that's such a model to all of us here at Xerces and to people around the country. So thank you. Um, now, reducing reliance on pesticides is an important component of the Bee City and Bee Campus programs because routine pesticide use can undermine the whole conservation objective of pollinator conservation. So we've designed um, this session, um, really the series of sessions, including the practitioner series that's happening next week, particularly for you, um, figuring out how to adjust pest management and to get everybody on board can be tricky. And our goal is to set you on the road to success, um, to reducing reliance on pesticides in your community so that you don't have to figure out this sticky piece all by yourself. A few months ago, we put, sent out a survey. Many of you responded to it. Thank you. It really help, is helping us and will help us for the next several years, I think, to guide the kind of information that we're able to provide for you. Um, and uh, one of the things that you all mentioned is good examples of um, integrated pest management. So that's part of what this um, is about, as well as teaching sort of the basic principles. One thing I want to say up front is that as we consider the opportunities to reduce pesticide use and the impacts, um, we see a natural partition between public lands and private lands. On public city land and also on campus land, where pest management is centralized, pesticide use reduction can be guided in, in a strategic way through what's known as integrated pest management or IPM. Now, IPM has been around for a long time pollinators are becoming a bigger piece of that. And certainly we see that through this lens. So sometimes we talk about integrated pest and pollinator management so that we make sure that we think about pollinators as a, a big piece of this. To reduce pesticide use on private lands, um, bee cities can use education and community-based initiatives to achieve these ends. We definitely encourage citizens and students to pay attention to both pieces so that they can work with their grounds managers on parks and campus lands, and also be equipped to consider community initiatives for, the, for working at the neighborhood level. So feel free to jot notes, uh, ask questions at the end, and we'll post this presentation on our YouTube site so you can refer back to it in the future. So uh, I'll start today by talking about the principles and methods of integrated pest management or IPM for those public lands. I'll discuss elements that you include or consider including in your IPM plan and some tips for success based upon the experience of others who've been through this before, including me. I'll wrap up by mentioning a few community initiatives that are good examples for reducing pesticide um, use in residential areas. And finally, I'll show a few resources that you may wanna consult after the webinar. I'm going to use the term BCUSA from time to time, and just so that you know, I'm referring to both the B-City and the B-Campus program. 
It's probably safe to say that your community or campus passed a resolution to become a BC USA because of an interest in supporting bees. Thank you. Uh, because as you may know, pollinators across the country are showing signs of stress and decline. For example, we're seeing range contractions and decline in abundance in, for, of many native pollinators. Habitat loss is a major factor, of course. Pesticides, a billion pounds of which are used each year in the US, are also a major cause of pollinator decline. Bee kills from pesticides have been widely reported, but even when pesticides don't kill, most pesticides also cause subtle adverse effects that can slowly result in population decline. Because of your commitment and the knowledge that you'll gain through the BC USA program and the other affiliates that you'll learn from along the way as well, we hope we'll never see a bee kill uh, in your communities. And more on the vision side, um, the dream for the BC USA program is really to be a model of management where pollinators, especially native bees, can not just survive, but thrive. So when your city or campus decided to become a bee city or bee campus, you committed to reduce the use of pesticides, create and adopt an integrated pest management plan designed to prevent pest problems, reduce pesticide use, and expand the use of non-chemical pest management methods, and to develop this plan in the first couple of years after joining. Now, one thing to note, the commitment is about developing a plan. Some communities have policies. Both can work. I tend to think of policies as broader guiding documents um, and plans as more detailed instructions. In either case, neither will be of any help unless the plan is living and respected and put into place. In other words, the plan turns into a program. What you don't want is a plan that sits on the shelf. To make your plan a program, IPM needs to be a priority in hiring, training, work plans, and be an ongoing element, even broader in development, maintenance, and communications efforts. As we move in, into this discussion, I wanna emphasize that what we're talking about today is not something to be limited solely to the pollinator habitat that you are creating with such enthusiasm in your parks and on your campuses. To really live up to the BC USA vision, um, IPPM um, is applicable and hopefully driving management on all of you, Matt, on all of your lands. We'll focus mostly on landscapes today, but ideally you'd think through IPM for uh, city and campus buildings, offices and classrooms, streets and trails, and neighborhoods. You're going to hear me use the word pest a lot in this presentation. Please keep in mind that I'm thinking not just of insect pests, but also of diseases and weeds. And similarly, when I discuss pesticides, I'm thinking not just of insecticides, but also fungicides, herbicides, and other sides that are meant to kill or repel pests. So what is IPM exactly? There are a lot of different definitions that are out there. And here are three good ones that we've selected. I'll take a few seconds of silence so that you can read these definitions. So hopefully you've had a chance to read them. And I'm, I wanna ask you, what do you see as the common concepts? Could you put your observations in the chat? Not the Q&A, but the chat here. And Molly will uh, take a look at those and give me a little bit of feedback here for a few major concepts in just a few minutes. Here at Xerces, we focus on long-term suppression of pests by eliminating the underlying causes. By doing this, we can achieve the goals of safety and lowered impacts to pollinators and people. IPM has a lot of promise. There are many studies and examples showing that strong IPM can significantly reduce pest incidents, complaints, and pesticide use over time. I won't go into those now because my purpose today is not to tell you why IPM is valuable, but rather how to implement strong IPM. But later, if you want some of that data, please contact me after. Molly, can you read a few of the observations from the chat? Yeah, I'm still waiting for some to come in. Would you want to repeat the prompt one more time just to give people another chance to write something? So what do you see as the common concepts in these three definitions that I've put up here? And you can read just a, a couple of them, Molly. Okay. 
Yeah, so someone says changing our behaviors, prevention, we have two preventions, using non-toxic and systemic methods, long-term focus, responding, not reacting, pesticide use as a last resort, changing how we do pest management using better alternatives. Thank you. That is really great um, to get your sense of what this is all about. And I think that um, I'm working with a, an audience that already knows a lot about this and is open, hopefully, to a lot of these concepts. So I'm going to go into more detail. So that describes the philosophy, um, but how do we do it? Let's take a, a, a deeper look at three principles that can be used to help you solve pest problems while minimizing pesticide reliance. Always start with prevention. Prevention is about addressing the root causes of pest issues with non-chemical approaches. Preventative practices keep you ahead of the game by keeping the system healthier or by eliminating the conditions that favor pests. Prevention practices are oriented toward ensuring that the pest populations don't get out of control. Note that prevention is about use of non-chemical strategies. Mechanical or physical disruption of the pest, such as hand weeding, also fits in here. The second principle is about understanding what pests are out there and if pest pressures or conflict with people even warrants intervention. This means observing and tracking pest pressure regularly. Observing can help you see if your non-chemical prevention methods are working and if you can continue to manage the pest with low impact methods. Thinking about pest pressure and incorporating decisions about this into your IPM plan is also important for reducing reliance on pesticides. In your IPM plan, we invite you to consciously make choices about when and where a pest is enough of a problem to justify the use of a pesticide. I'll discuss that more in a bit. Finally, in some cases, there may be pests that defy preventative management and move above tolerable levels. While we do not encourage the use of pesticides, if someone is going to apply a pesticide, it's important that they understand how to limit the harm by reducing the risk of exposure and by using pesticides of lower toxicity. So IPM is built on these three principles. Like a three-legged stool, these three principles together form a balanced framework that can reduce reliance on pesticides and reduce impacts to pollinators or people if each principle is included. Note that I'm not just talking about substituting safer chemicals for toxic chemicals. Sometimes people think that substituting a newer product that may be hyped as being greener or safer is what IPM is all about. And that is not the approach we recommend, at least not exclusively. So let's start with prevention um, in a little bit more detail, a few 30,000 foot level concepts. In a landscape uh, setting, prevention is basically about the skilled use of horticultural strategies to keep the landscapes healthy. For buildings, same thing, good building maintenance to keep facilities in good condition. It can include a host of general best management practices, many of which you may already be doing. Um, for example, the principle of right plant, right place. Choosing native, adapted, low maintenance plants is a primary prevention tool. Taking care of the soil too, for example, by using compost, mulch, slow release fertilizer if used, avoiding compaction, erosion, and soil disturbance. Other basic measures shown on this list are also important, such as sanitation. That's not just about emptying the trash containers, um, in a landscape context, it means making sure that you dispose of weed seed heads and other propagules and disease tissue in a way that won't lead to further invasion and spread. Mowing high and often is a recommended practice for healthy turf that minimizes weed pressure. When it comes to invasives and emerging pests, we recommend consulting local experts for specific prevention practices. Maybe you're wondering about that last bullet that I skipped over, maintaining diverse landscapes. I skipped over it because I wanted to give it more focused attention on its own slide. Did you know that giving more, um, more attention and protecting and expanding habitat for native pollinators actually comes with its own benefits for pest control? 
Many natural enemies that eat the parasitized pests also consume pollen. So adding flowers for bees also lays the groundwork for a healthy population of natural enemies who will control pests. So let's look at some examples for the second principle, the second leg of the stool, monitoring. Monitoring is about knowing which pests are in your system, what habitats they're occupying, tracking the level of pressure, and determining whether pressure is at a point that might trigger intervention such as pesticide use. This step requires that staff can identify weeds, insects, and diseases and understand their life cycles and habitat or pull in somebody who can. Monitoring can include a lot of items. It is sometimes about doing inspections to note the presence and abundance of the pest itself. A couple of examples are shown here, including dragging for ticks in a grassy area and using sticky bands on a tree trunk to detect the invasive spotted, spotted lanternfly. Turning a leaf over to look for the presence of pests like white flies or aphids underneath is another example of looking for the pest itself. Monitoring, however, is also about looking for pest conducive conditions. This would include things like testing soil chemistry and biology on a sports field or doing a detailed inspection of the kitchen and boiler room in the campus cafeteria. On the right is a portion of an inspection form for facilities from the Portland Community College IPM plan. If you attend our session next week, you'll hear more about the really excellent monitoring and inspection systems that Portland Community College has in place to inform and guide their decisions and actions. Doing this step well, although it may seem like a lot of work is really important to reducing pesticide reliance, monitoring can actually save on costs and prevent unnecessary ecological damage by reducing pesticide inputs to the system. And keeping written records helps you to be systematic and track trends over time. We recommend that you report invasives and emergence to uh, your local county or state if there's a reporting system for that as well. And keep in mind that not every sign of damage on a plant is a sign of something out of whack. For example, this photo shows damage, yes, but from a pest, no. Those circular holes bit out of the corners were made by leaf cutter bees. A, a type of native pollinator that uses small pieces of leaves to actually make its nests. Let's go to the last principle and the third leg of the three-legged stool, limiting pesticide harm. The best city and campus programs reduce the potential for harm, not just to pollinators, but also people, pets, and water resources. Usually the first thing um, that we tend to think about with pesticides is how toxic is it? Limiting toxicity risk is one strategy to reduce the potential for harm. This means avoiding chemicals that pose a high potential at labeled rates for mortality to bees or to you know, known harm to pets or people or other highlighted resources. Also important is limiting the use of chemicals that are known to pose longer term sublethal effects such as reproductive harms, cancer, impacts to learning and so on. Keep in mind that pesticides that are toxic to people are not necessarily the same chemicals that are toxic to pollinators. So where do you figure out how toxic a chemical is and to, to which group? You can look at the label, which will provide some clue to short-term capacity of the pesticide to cause mortality or other health effects to specific groups of animals. But you won't find on the label um, things like the potential for the pesticide to cause developmental or reproductive or cancer effects. You'll need to look at more specialized information to find that. The city of San Francisco, who will be speaking next week, has done really strong work in sifting through the toxicology of many chemicals using a comprehensive set of factors, and they came up with their own approved list. You'll hear more about that next week. Many cities and campuses are, have cut through that complexity by requiring the use of organic pesticides ex exclusively. Organic pesticides are natural materials that usually show lower toxicity than synthetics to a wide array of organisms. Specific to pollinators, here's a list of resource materials that can help you assess the toxic risk of materials that you may be considering. You can Google on the names of any resource on this list to find it. Please keep in mind though, that the vast majority of what we know about toxicity of specific pesticides to pollinators is based upon A, 
test to one non-native bee, the European honeybee, and B conducted in the lab on single ingredients only. So please keep in mind a general attitude of precaution because we know that there's huge data gaps that will probably never be completely filled. We also know that studies show higher sensitivity of a lot of bees than the honeybee, for instance. Another way to limit pesticide harm is to limit the chance of exposure wherever possible by preventing contact between the pesticides and your public, their pets, or pollinators in the park or nearby streams. This might mean no spray zones, buffers, or advanced notification systems, or all three of these together. Also think about timing. Um, if there's not much time between the application and when people or bees show up, exposure is likely to happen. Realistically though, even if people, pets, or pollinators are not around when an application occurs, exposure can still occur. Many pesticides can stick to plants or get inside plant tissue, and persistent pesticides may stick around for days, weeks, or even months after an application. Pesticides can also move with the breeze or run off. This slide shows a few ways in which pesticide residues may expose people, pets, or pollinators, even if they're not around. You can see, you know, especially with kids, skin contact and breathing vapors when they spend so much time rolling around in the grass. Same thing with pets. And um, for pollinators, bees can be sprayed directly. The flowers, if they're sprayed um, even before bees are active or overnight, can still have residues on them that can expose bees. And systemic pesticides get inside plant tissue, exposing bees over a long period of time. The most effective way to limit exposure is to limit the amount of pesticide put out there and to be very cognizant of the location and timing of any applications. So what are some concrete ways to limit pesticide harm? Let's be clear, again, the overall best way is to switch away from pesticides toward non-chemical methods wherever you can. And however, when and where you think you will be using pesticides, build in ways to choose substances that are less toxic and or to apply in a way that, that reduces the exposure to bees, people, pets, and aquatics. Some tips that we recommend, including no spray zones, Many cities have pesticide-free parks, which is a great method of letting the public know about places that are completely pesticide-free and for giving you, you know, active places to practice some of those methods um, for non-chemical management in real time. Warning systems, signs can be helpful. Advanced notifications are also helpful, including automated telephone calls to people who sign up for alerts. But pollinators can't be alerted in advance. So one way to avoid um, impacting pollinators is to avoid application to flowering plants, avoid soil applications where nesting may be occurring and to avoid use of systemics. Stopping routine hidden pesticide uses such as fertilizer herbicide products that are combined um, and choosing lower toxicity products are also additional ways to limit the potential for harm. Targeted treatments are another way. If you can, this is not always easy, but finding a product that's targeted toward the pest um, and avoiding broad spectrum pesticides and using the product at the lowest effective rate in as small an area as possible is also a good way. Okay, I skipped over one of the bullets again so I could emphasize it in its own slide. Cosmetic use, what is it? The use of pesticides primarily for aesthetic reasons, often associated with ultra manicured landscapes such as shown here. Cosmetic pesticides incur significant unnecessary environmental risks. We encourage BC USA affiliates to eliminate the use of insecticides, fungicides, herbicides, and any other side primarily applied to maintain a certain aesthetic. Considering letting go of cosmetic use also leads to thinking more deeply about habitat just a side story, um, one of the first tasks I was assigned at my first wildlife biologist job with the Forest Service was building brush piles in uh, an, a recent clear cut with some of the slash that had been left. The purpose was to create longer lasting habitat for small mammals and other critters that needed that kind of structure and shelter that wouldn't really be available for a long time in the tree plantation that was gonna follow the clear cut. Many bees have a similar need for structure. We often tell people that bees like their habitat a little bit messy. 
Bumblebees, for example, will often choose nesting and overwintering sites that are overgrown and uh, a little bit undisturbed. So providing habitats that are not super manicured or toxic is important, and especially so for those affiliates that manage highly developed parks or campuses and don't have much natural land. As you consider letting go of cosmetic use, you may find that the community does support a more relaxed standard. And it helps to remember to differentiate pests that are simply nuisances, for example, dandelions, from something that could lead to a public health or significant ecological problems, such as that spotter and lantern fly that I mentioned earlier. Your pest management plan should be differentiated between nuisance and non-nuisance pests. Most nuisance pests wouldn't merit pesticides, just a shift in management practices. Now, letting go of cosmetic pesticide use doesn't mean devaluing beauty in any way. It may, just means looking at beauty through a broader lens of system health that is more than skin deep. Stopping cosmetic use contributes to a system that supports a variety of species. Okay. Um, I want to show now a couple of examples of these three principles um, in in, in practice. So we've taken uh, just a couple of examples that are common uh, in parks and on campuses. And um, let's talk about how you can put these principles into action. So for stinging wasps, yellow jackets, this is a common problem. Starting with prevention, as we recommended, um, a good way to think about this first is to limit access to um, food and water um, and to nest sites. You have to know about your pest and you have to know basically what they feed on and what um, they require in terms of habitat. Yellow jackets feed primarily on protein sources such as spiders and insects, but they'll also readily feed on sugary foods. And um, they, the yellow jack jackets are most problematic for people usually nest in the ground or in wall voids. So thinking through prevention, minimizing the conditions that favor a pest lead to a conflict. Overflowing trash bins, like this one next to a building would be a magnet for, for yellow jackets. Um, you can use instead tightly sealed, frequently emptied um, trash containers. You can also teach safe behaviors, such as avoiding swatting, of covering food and drinks outside, et cetera. When I say limiting access to nest sites, sometimes you find like on playgrounds, like open tubular structures that are not sealed on the end, have no end cap, that's a prime place where um, stinging insects can sometimes get inside and make nests. So you'd wanna cover those kinds of things. Monitoring, as a practitioner, you need to be able to differentiate problem species from non-problem species. In this case, you know, we have wasps in our landscapes that are really not problematic. Um, and you can tell which ones are around by looking at the nests. Um, this upper picture here shows the U-shaped structure of a paper wasp, which is usually not a species that poses much concern to people. Um, you can usually safely leave these alone. Um, they sometimes nest under eaves and maybe you'd wanna knock those down if they're too close to a door or a public site, but generally you wouldn't need to worry about these. Um, these paper wasps can be identified with a thin waist and legs hanging down behind when they fly. Non-chemical prevention methods that are available um, for suppressing populations include trapping, which can be useful for, address, for reducing the number of foragers. You wouldn't want to use this unless there's a lot of food around, but it, it can be really effective. Research at Cornell shows that use of these traps can reduce the number of yellow jackets by as much as 30%, and they recommend putting them out about a week before you might have say, something like a major event where there might be a lot of um, people around. Some people recommend destroying nests. Um, this is effective, um, but you'd wanna leave that to a professional and only do that where people are in harm's way. If pesticides are used, you'd only wanna treat small areas using a spot specific aerosol or a dust treatment and only a small amount is necessary. Athletic fields can be hard places to manage because they're subjected to um, a lot of wear and tear. So it's a good one for a second uh, example. They need to be safe for kids um, so that they don't trip. And at the same time, kids shouldn't be exposed to uh, an excess of harmful pesticides. Even herbicides have been shown to have detrimental human health impacts. So how do you do it? Again, start with 
prevention with these cultural practices shown here. A basic tenet of uh, IPM is not treating with a pesticide until a pest exceeds a threshold density. When you're looking at managing weeds in athletic fields, there's no single source for appropriate thresholds. Weed species um, thresholds seem to vary with the species and the location. Keep in mind though, that over time, attitudes have shifted on some turf plants that used to be seen as weeds, for example, clovers. Once seen as a negative component of turf, clovers with smaller leaves and lower growth habits called microclovers are now seen as a desirable addition with the potential to actually significantly reduce inputs of fertilizers, pesticides, and even mowing. One study at Ohio State reported up to 50% cost reduction for fertilizer, 20% reduction in pesticide use, namely herbicides, and 2.5% reduction for fuel and labor costs. The reduction in herbicide use was attributed to the fact that the clover shaded out germinating weed seeds. The study also observed that Kentucky bluegrass turf was significantly less drought stressed during dry down periods when microclover was part of the turf. On limiting pesticide harm, we recommend uh, avoiding pre-emergence, mowing prior to treatment um, to remove blooms that bees would, would visit. Um, in the Northeastern states, there's some great examples of organic turf management. Um, in New York, um, they have they have a list of what's allowed on school fields. They've just passed a, a pretty uh, progressive measure and you can look at that uh, website to learn a little bit more about um, how they are um, moving forward with that. So now that we've covered the basic framework of IPM and a couple of examples, um, let's look at what you'd expect to see in a well-crafted IPM plan leading to a well-executed program. First, for an IPM plan, why go to all that trouble of writing it down? It's so much simpler not to, right? But a written plan or policy creates a common understanding of what's acceptable and what's not. It's really foundational for building a strong IPM program. It can bridge staff changes, et cetera. So the planning process is really a decision-making process. And so we recommend also that you start with good examples, but make sure that you ground your decisions in your own community. If you want your IPM plan to be well executed, start with the end in mind. This is a basic principle by Stephen Covey, who some of you might know. For instance, will the IPM consider all city and campus lands or just a subset like parks and landscapes? If you're considering all city facilities, think about things like convention centers, roadways, et cetera. A really important part of the plan is defining what your goals are. What are your desired outcomes? These underlie everything else and getting agreement on these upfront makes it easier to develop your specific strategies. In addition, difficult decisions may be necessary in the future and shared goals really serve as a touchstone and a reminder of the values and priorities that the community has agreed on. So goals should focus on desired outcomes. These could include things such as I've shown here on the three bullets on the left. Another example goal might be to be an educational resource for residents and businesses. Now, good IPM programs also designate a central coordinator. The coordinator needs to work with city and campus leadership, the public, uh, that can mean residents and businesses or students if you're talking about campuses. They need to be able to work with other departments, maintenance, ground staff, and also contractors. So the coordinator should have a really good understanding of the full environmental and social setting, and also the ability to form good relationships and communicate with all these different parties. Of course, responsibility doesn't end there. Clear expectations for maintenance and ground staff combined with regular and informative training and the equipment and tools needed to do their job is also essential. Other staff, faculty say, are important too. They can contribute to the IPM effort if they understand their roles in prevention and reporting. A next really important step is to compile a list of your pests. Start with what you manage, perhaps, like what you're already managing against with insecticides, herbicides, and fungicides now. And perhaps that list would seem endless. So pay attention. Think carefully about what you're calling a pest. Is it something that is truly causing damage to the ecosystem or causing damage to assets or a risk to human health? Or is it something that you're calling a pest mostly a nuisance like we talked about before, perhaps 
something that's culturally less acceptable, but overall harmless, such as dandelions. It's important to differentiate because nuisance organisms don't necessarily merit the urgency that might result in a pesticide application. As you start to compile your list, think about this. Also work to, to fully understand each pest habitat needs and life cycles. Then you can investigate the prevention and non-chemical control strategies and plan for ongoing monitoring and inspection. In addition, you wanna be thinking about and incorporating into the plan action thresholds that may warrant an intervention, such as a pesticide application, in the event that those prevention strategies are insufficient to manage the pest at tolerable levels. We'll talk about that more in just a few minutes. This example shown on the left is from the Wilsonville IPM plan and it contains all of these elements. Action thresholds you don't see here because they're in a different section of the plan. Now intervention doesn't always mean pesticides. And even if you know you have a pest issue, how do you deal with it if non-chemical methods aren't working? Are pesticides always the, the, the next answer? Well, not always, say, two scientists who lead an organization called the Ecological Research Institute. They're focused on citizen science efforts to monitor the occurrence of emerald ash borer, an invasive that kills ash trees and is fairly widespread across the eastern states right now. They've developed this decision tree that shows the different strategies, um, everything from cut the tree to treat to uh, do nothing, basically monitor the tree. And you can see the criteria beneath each recommendation. This kind of decision tree is a really useful example of using affected trees to allow evolution to do its work, to help us find those resistant genomes. That's one of the purposes of that right. Um, right-hand side, just let the tree be and continue to monitor it. That also can allow us to detect natural enemies that may come in um, to develop for this particular invasive species. It's sort of next generation IPM. As part of the IPM plan, we recommend that you do make decisions about pesticides, what you'll allow or what's disallowed. Um, you can determine these based upon your goals. Letting your goals drive a list is, is a really good strategy. This is where also the considerations of toxicity come into play. And if you don't have a toxicologist on your team, it might be easiest to use systems developed by others. For example, on the left, we have a screening system developed by the city of San Francisco that takes into account toxi you know, the toxicological hazards um, uh, based on multiple levels and sort of a deep look. We could keep it simple, or you could keep it simple, excuse me, um, as many cities have and decide to go fully organic. In addition to considering the toxicity, you wanna to think about the formulation and the method. Things like baits, crack and crevice, spot sprays are much preferred to dust and broadcast sprays that basically would mean broader exposure. Let's go back to the idea of action thresholds. When does a pest population exceed a tolerable limit and is a pesticide justified? What's been effective for many cities is to consider the expectations for different sites. For example, people may desire a very well-maintained, weed-free grass lawn in front of City Hall, but in the park or the quad, a more relaxed attitude toward flowers in the lawn, maybe even dandelions may be acceptable. And setting different expectations for different parts of the campus or the city is called zone management. Many cities use this. Now, in this example that I'm showing here, the zone management sort of taken to a more sophisticated level, this PHAER system, pesticide hazard and exposure reduction. Um, I believe it was developed in large part to protect humans, but this can be adapted for protection of pollinators and other resources. The idea here is that the higher the likelihood of exposure, the more important it is to reduce risk. Most of these systems use a green, yellow, red scheme. Um, so for example, on the right, you've got a schematic of a place called Cabrillo Ballpark. The green areas represent the areas where people are likely to be frequently. You can see it's a baseball field and you can see where the kids are gonna be all the time. So there's a high likelihood of exposure in those areas, it's the green area. Um, in those areas, you'd only allow the least toxic pesticides or possibly no pesticides at all. Yellow zones are areas with less potential for exposure and a broader range of yellow materials. See the list on the left um, are permitted in the yellow areas. 
red areas are limited to special circumstances that they would that would allow higher hazard chemicals under those special circumstances. There's another example here on the lower left for the Alice Keck Park Memorial Gardens. In this example, the whole area is deemed green. If you go this route, we do encourage you to review and set zones and thresholds um, with stakeholders. These cities and campuses are really enthusiastic about the commitment to plant pollinator gardens. And these habitat sites attract a lot of interest and are so important as demonstration sites. But make sure that you're sourcing bee safe plants with plants free of residues that could harm pollinators after they're planted, especially for those community sponsored pollinator gardens. To source bee safe plants, we've done um, work recently in producing some materials for you. Um, there's a shorthand over here on the right. We recommend that first you seek out organic plants and seeds, and that you also avoid plants um, grown with neonicotinoids and other similar systemic insecticides, especially if you cannot find organic plants. Um, and third, ask what steps your nursery takes to offer plants grown with pollinator-friendly pest management. We go into more detail on that in those materials that we've produced recently. Um, it's built on that same three-legged stool, and we. Um, you can, you can learn a lot by looking at those resources and hopefully the same principles you'll find echoed that we've talked about here. So you may be wondering, what are the keys to success with IPM? How can we make this work? First, people. People are always the most important element to success or failure. Um, so we recommend spend time assembling your team. Involve and keep informed the leadership of the community, such as the city council or the campus president. Include citizen or student stakeholders as part of the team and in the review. Make sure the staff is well trained once the plan is together. And of course, staff needs to be on the team too, the groundskeepers. Build support for the IPM program and help everyone feel that they are part of the solution. A dedication to the IPM goal of reducing reliance on and risk from pesticides is very important to the long-term success and being willing to learn and adapt is also critical. This may mean taking the time to consult quality resources as you're developing your plan, checking with peers in uh, who are part of your geography or other bee cities or campuses and being open to collaborative input from your communities. We recommend that you solicit feedback during development of the IPM plan and as time goes on so the program can be adjusted and monitored as needed. This will help assure success over the long term. An annual report such as this one shown here from the city of Santa Barbara is a really good mechanism for monitoring, discussing and soliciting feedback on your IPM progress with the broader community. Finally, ongoing and sufficient funding is important. Prevention can be very cost effective but there's often a need for landscape redesign, training, and other investments, especially in the early part of the IPM program. Recognizing this need and providing adequate funding will also help ach achieve success. So cities and campus public lands are key, but for those of you who look to the residential space, you may wonder sometimes just how to get households to reduce the pesticide impact. We know that residential pesticide use accounts for a really large footprint in America, and making progress here is also part of the solution. The key really is to inspire, educate, and organize. Let me showcase just a few examples. About 10 years ago, on the left, a motivated landscape designer living in the Overlook neighborhood of Portland, Oregon, started reaching out to the 400 households in her neighborhood. She started a volunteer cadre and together they went around household to household talking to people. They motivated people in more than 100 households to create pollinator gardens and um, to adopt a pesticide free pledge. They offered events, resources, and most of all, an identity bigger than just any one household. This is a great example of the power of community and years after initiating this effort, it's still going strong. In the center, some cities use demonstrations and tours to good advantage. For example, advocates in Ashland, Oregon created a certified pollinator habitat program that promotes pesticide-free gardening. Um, people have to apply to be part of this. And then once they're part, they can be part of an annual tour. And through these annual tours, 
they inspire and educate the larger community to gain further adoption of these same practices. In Marblehead, Massachusetts, citizens developed the state's first municipal organic lawn demonstration site on city land um, on a 2000 square foot plot quite a few years ago. They develop educational materials about organic lawn care and they hold educational seminars for professional landscapers and the public and to mentor other community groups. Up on the upper right, if you live in an HOA, a homeowners association, you may be frustrated at pesticide applications to common spaces or an expectation that households will manage their landscapes routinely with pesticides to maintain a cosmetic standard. In Oregon recently, thanks to community activism, the legislature passed a bill that requires HOAs to notify homeowners in advance of a pesticide application and allows property owners to opt out of centralized pesticide use. It also prohibits homeowner associations from requiring application of pesticide on owners' properties except as necessary for ecological or public health reasons. This example and other policy examples can serve as models elsewhere. Of course, one could go even further uh, without having to go to the policy space. You could work with your own HOA to get agreement to include um, a really strong program of monitoring and prevention in common areas, which could eliminate much pesticide use. You could also propose to limit the pesticides that are on the list, um, for instance, going organic only or going with a low toxic list that you can find um, from some of the examples that we've given you. Moving to our last example on the lower left in Decatur, Georgia, uh, where homeowner mosquito spraying is widespread an educational initiative there, um, started by Bcater, uses signs to help people make the linkage between their backyard choices and impact to bees. Now, um, Susie's in Bee City, USA, and we have a lot of resources to help. And here are a few that we think are particularly relevant to this topic. Um, pollinator protection for cities and campuses goes into those elements to consider in your IPM plan. Organic site preparation is a great resource if you wanna establish your pollinator habitat organically. We have this wonderful resource um, publication called Pollinator Friendly Parks. This shows the version that's been on our website for a while and the new version is probably gonna be out in just a couple of months and it's new and updated and hopefully it's gonna be a really great resources for you all. Buying Be Safe Plants is that resource I referred to a few minutes ago um, to help you find plants that don't have residues um, for your pollinate gar pollinator gardens, how to ask your nursery those questions. That guidance for protecting habitat from pesticide contamination goes over sort of more high level concepts about protecting habitat. You'll find that it is um, in many ways oriented toward an agricultural setting, but if some of you who are working with natural lands might find that really useful as well. And then over here on the right, we have this really great resources about helping your community create an effective mosquito management plan. So these are the few that I've highlighted, but we have a lot more. And um, if you regularly check the BCUSA site, you'll find a page focused on pesticides and resources that gets updated frequently, um, that contains a, a lot of information specific to your needs. And if you go to the Xerces site, you can go into the pesticide section to find all kinds of additional items. I think I mentioned that survey that we put out a couple of months ago. Um, again, thank you to those of you who responded to that. It's helping us to sort of shape what we provide for you all. And one of the things that you all mentioned that you wanted were what a good example IPM plans. So right here, we have a few plans or policies that we think are good examples. And there are many others. This is just a short list that I could fit on one page right here. And we're always interested in learning about other good examples. There's a lot of you out there. We have hundreds of affiliates. So please get in touch if you want us to learn more about your particular plan and how it's going. We're always interested in talking to you directly because we learn a lot that way. So I hope you come back uh, to attend part two of the session next week. I'm really excited about our speakers um, from San Francisco. We've got uh, Chris Guy, uh, Chris, I'm sorry, Chris Geiger, <laughs> uh, who is fabulous. I met him years ago and I'm really excited for him. And then we also have Portland Community College with Jack Lucier, who 
uh, gave me a tour once of his campus and I'm also really excited to have him here. Um, they'll be here, it'll be an exciting day. And if you haven't yet signed up, you can find the registration link at the B-City uh, B, B City USA website under the events link. And with that, thank you so much. Um, we're always open to questions from you um, and helping you out where we can. So don't hesitate to contact us at this email address. And um, we're ready for questions. Ame Code is with us. She's the director of our program here at Xerces and she's gonna help me with the Q&A. Hey, everybody. Yeah, we have two questions so far. Uh, and the one, Sharon, and by the way, that was awesome. I, have, I, I learned a ton there. So, and I've been in this business for a long time. So that, thank you so much. Um, question from Paige. What are IPM methods used to fight funguses resulting in turf issues? And the example she gave was brown patch. And I will ask Sharon to answer it, but before, if, if you don't have a specific answer right now, Sharon, there are so many examples of pests that we're always dealing with. It's the sort of thing um, we can get back to you on that. We can take a note we, if you can send us your email. Uh, also, you know, it's amazing what you can find online, just kind of plugging in brown patch and IPM and see what comes out. But Sharon, do you have an idea to start off? Well, okay, I, thank you, Ame, for emphasizing that, you know, a lot of times, when people come to us, we also need to look up these particular things because we don't know every pest and every pest management solution um, in the world. <laughs> um, and we learn by dealing with these real world problems. But let's go to that three-legged stool as a framework because that's where we always start when we're thinking about this. So looking at root causes, if you've got a fungal issue, there could be a problem with the soil not being um, well-drained. Um, there are ways to promote aeration in soil. Um, maybe you've got grass in an area that's just not conducive to grass growing. You know, sometimes people try to grow grass in really shady areas and grass just doesn't do as well there. So look at root causes first. Um, monitoring, you know, try to figure out, the monitoring can also help you figure out if you've got a root cause at play. You know, where is it occurring? When does it show up? Is it associated with any you know, factors that you can identify. Um, uh, the third one, uh, right now, I don't know about, you know, this particular disease. I don't know exactly what causes it um, and the fungicides that people are using and if there's lower tox fungicides or lower methods of exposure. But of course, going back to the three-legged stool, we would recommend that you look at um, doing everything you can with non-chemical management first. Uh, before moving to a pesticide. And if you do use it, use it in a very targeted site-specific way with as low toxic chemical as you can. All right, well, we also got um, another answer, which was no night watering. So there's another, which is a, a common piece of the problem when, you, when you're dealing with fungal issues aeration, water are often things to look to first to figure out, can I make changes in order to minimize the habitat that allows this fungal um, or disease to thrive? So thank you, Jack, for that. Um, two other questions were really about how this would be available. Usually we put them up on Xerces YouTube page. Is there also a B-City page that this, and usually they're uploaded in the next couple of days. And is that the correct answer, Sharon? Yes, uh, I don't, no, like it might take a few days or a week, but um, the presentation as a video will be available um, at the YouTube site. Um, and, you know, we, we, I don't know, I guess we could provide a PDF if people want that as well, just so that they have something. Um, but so, you know, either of those are ways that we could provide this if you wanted to have it on hand. That's, that's a great idea. It is an awesome presentation. I plan on looking, I've actually took notes on all the slides I want to grab from you for my presentation, Sharon. So <laughs> um, yeah. Well, I have one question for the people who asked about the presentation being available, which is that we're working on creating some template presentations to provide to affiliates so they can then go and present them to their community. So for people who ask about the presentation, is this something you'd be interested in having a presentation about pesticide reduction that you could give to your community? Or are you mostly hoping for 
this recorded presentation as more of a resource. And we can just let that one sit. And if people want to answer with that, that'd be great. And we can move on to the next question. One, one chat was, um, one person did like it, thought it was a great idea for the template. And others said they were using it as a resource. So it sounds like that would be, I love that idea, Molly. Thank you for thinking of that. We got a question here, a few coming in. One about mosquito management in an organic garden. And um, I could take that. And then I'll, if Sharon, if you want to add any other ideas. So um, lots of thought there. The biggest thing to think about with mosquitoes is that it's easiest to manage them when they are larvae and managing where they would be breeding is the most important. So anywhere and and then so anywhere you can find where there might be mosquitoes or reservoirs of stagnant water where they could be breeding would be the best is the most important thing to do. So can, is it your gutters? Is it tires? Is it a little can? You know, sometimes even something is really wet grass that uh, that doesn't have much drainage in it. So if you want to, you know, that can hold enough water to for mosquitoes. So, you know, thinking through where those mosquitoes might be breeding is the easiest and best step to be taking. Um, I don't know if you have any, you know, also the other thing to think about when we're dealing with mosquitoes is the vast majority of mosquitoes are nuisance mosquitoes. There are some mosquitoes that are pet, that are species that vector disease. And Sometimes the fear of mosquitoes, because the media is talking about things like Zika or chikungunya and West Nile virus, sometimes the fear is more heightened when not all mosquitoes are going to be leading to, uh, to public health concerns as well. I don't know if you want to type in a little bit more about your garden and anything specific that, and we also, as, she, as Sharon showed, we have a number of resources for managing mosquitoes. If you could actually go right onto Xerces website and click on ecologically sound mosquito management and hopefully there'll be some information there. Um, we also, see. our next Bee City blog coming out um, in October is about Decatur's uh, work around mosquito management. So that'll be a fun resource to keep an eye out for. Yeah, and part of that is really like helping shift your, your communities thinking, and that's a great point for your organic garden. You know, I talk about dealing with the breeding area in your yard, but the, if your neighbors aren't taking the same steps, then you're not going to be able, you're not going to get where you need to. So having it be a community-wide effort to be managing mosquitoes. And, you know, there's actually in South Carolina, there's a great group. This woman started the a SWAT, which is the Standing Water Attack Team. And it's a bunch of young kids who go around and help minimize breeding grounds and are taking huge steps to better protect their community from both nuisance and um, vector species of mosquitoes. So a uh, couple more questions coming in. So I, let's see what we got. Do you have any thoughts or anyone in the audience on IPM for prairie or natural landscape conversion or establishment, specifically for legume weeds? We're trying to convert many areas of campus, but end up needing to use quite a few herbicides to keep up with the weeds. First question, the first piece of that is, um, Sharon showed another resource, which is specifically organic site prep. And that's, ex I think the exact piece for you to look at to, for ideas of how to suppress the current weeds and in order to prep a site so that you can create these prairie areas without having to be reliant on heavy herbicide use to start. So look there and then reach back out to us if you have more questions. Um, Phyllis is here, yay, Phyllis. Uh, she wants to know, Phyllis is um, the, you know, the, the woman behind Bee City USA, thanks for coming. Which cities or counties have cosmetic pesticide policies? Sharon, do you know the answer? Um, that's a great question. I, I know that there are more in Canada. I think that this, um, issue has received more attention over the years in Canada. Um, I think that there's a few in the United States, but I can't remember off the top of my head right now, but we can find out. Um, I assume you're wanting to see policies from communities that have decided to discontinue cosmetic use, if that's what you're asking. Phyllis? Um, Phyllis was just noting that Ann Barclow is on the call and she is the woman who started SWAT. So 
Yes, thank you. Uh, I think she is on the call. Uh, Phyllis, she asked you a question. Could you repeat the question, Sharon? Oh, me? I just, I, I, if you were wanting um, examples of um, policies from cities that have discontinued um, cosmetic use, I can look in my files and try to find, I can, just can't quite remember, but there are more in Canada. I believe entire provinces have banned. It's been a couple of years since I've looked at this, but that's what I think I remember from Canada. Uh, you are right. Yes, I think it was Ontario. You're Yes, a couple of them have. Good, good memory. It looks like we're through questions. Is there anything else? Also, if you have questions that come up afterwards, again, please feel free. I've got this, you know, email address here. Um, you know, contact us at any time. Like I said, we learn from you. And, and we're really interested, again, in hearing about the good work that you're doing. So contact us if you're proud of what you're doing, because we may want you to be part of our practitioner series. Um, everybody's looking for good examples. And at, you know, it's really nice, especially to have good examples from across the country um, as well. So um, just a reminder on that. So a few more questions are coming in. This is great. One is someone reminded us, and actually I took a note on this as well. There is no such thing as a weed. There is, in many ways, there's no such thing as a pest. Sometimes there are things that are in the wrong place, but everything has a value and a benefit. Um, in, in our, in, in this, in the amazing world we live in. So thank you for reminding us of that. It's so true. You know, a yellow jacket in a playground is potentially a pest and a problem, but yellow jackets are not overall. And we really need to be thoughtful about that. Um, all of the, I am a huge forager and so many of the things that people think of as weeds uh, make their way to my dinner table and my I'm proud to say so <laughs> exposing too much so thank you for that message um, here's a tough one Sharon and one that Xerxes is grappling with uh, which is yay or nay introduce biological control so and she gave the example of weevil, weevil to advantage spotted map weed well uh, as if if you're not aware of it Xerxes has um, some concerns about some biological controls, and we are in the process of trying to think deeply through this because we know that um, it is a method of management that's an alternative to pesticides. Um, we know that sometimes the impacts could be less, and then in other cases, they may just be a little bit less explored, um, particularly with displacement of native species. So we, at this point, are not recommending augmentative biological control, which means going out and um, purchasing or receiving biological control organisms that have been reared in the lab. We do very much emphasize and promote conservation biological control, which is that natural enemy slide that I showed. Like if you're creating habitat of native species, diverse native habitat, you're gonna be pulling in natural enemies that are present in the system that can go to work, you know, the way they always have in your particular area on the pests that are, that are present in your area. Um, and that way is the safest way to incorporate biological control into your pest management. Um, but as I may said, we're taking a deeper dive and, and trying to see if we can come up with more um, specific targeted guidance on particular biological control organisms. A couple other ones. So this one, I'm not certain. Well, so it says mulch beds, only mulch, no plants are sprayed for weeds under trees and fence lines. Are there options? Probably only an organic herbicide looking for recommendations I can provide the city. I don't, I didn't fully understand. It sounds like you're trying to deal with weeds in beds, but you don't want to spray. Maybe if you could type it again, or Shara, did you understand? Not sure if I understood, but mulch can mean a lot of different things. Um, by and large, mulch is a good way to cover the soil. Um, 
Now at Xerces, we always think it's important to leave a little bit of soil uncovered for all those ground nesting bees, but um, that can present a conflict with weed management. Um, we also encourage people to leave leaves. Now leaving leaves actually creates great habitat for a lot of those natural enemies, um, as well as providing habitat for overwintering bees. Um, so leaves themselves can be good mulch. Um, there's been some really good research on mulch out of um, Washington State University, and um, at least in the Northwest, and it may be a different recommendation in other parts of the country, but um, mulch can be very effective if it's chipped from, um, you know, native trees in the area and put down, you know, like three to six inches deep. Um, and I've done that in my front yard, which is a sort of semi-pollinator garden, and I almost never need to weed it. Um, but, you know, I mean, like I said, um, using mulch that heavy is, it also really has a lot of benefits for the soil. I've seen my soil dramatically improve with the use of mulch. But again, thinking about ground nesting bees, it's not 100% the answer. So um, we don't recommend use of artificial mulches. Sometimes you'll see um, shredded tires and things like that. There's just way too many, um, you know, environmental toxic issues with things like that. So we definitely do not recommend those types of um, artificial mulches. So we got a clarification and also a quick note someone mentioned, which I thought was great, that they don't need much intervention. So they're struggling to write a plan, um, but they, because they do so little intervention and I did type an answer maybe, but let's, I'll let you get back to that, Sharon. I'm gonna jump back to this question about mulching. Are city sprays under trees where they have mulched with wood chips and along fence lines for weeds, but I'd love to provide recommendations for an alternative to spraying the weeds that pop up in those spaces. So they don't want any plants there is what she's saying. And um, so fence lines is an interesting one. I will answer and um, both Sharon and I, well, anyway, this is something that, that we were involved with a long time ago. One thing you can do along fence lines, and it's easiest to do this when you're putting a new fence, is actually creating a small area where you put concrete underneath that fence for 12 inches or so, and you just actually just prepare it so that you can't have any weeds growing up in that. That's something they've done in Eugene, Oregon. It's been very effective so they don't have to spray fence lines. Um, it gives you that space so that you can go right up to that, that small concrete area. Um, and then under trees, something that I think is beautiful, it's not no plants, but also here in Eugene where I live and I've seen in other cities as well, they actually see they put fescue or flowers around the tree because the reason they don't want anything to grow is because they can't mow there. So if you can put in these flowers then, you know, or bunch grasses, you can have a really beautiful circle around your tree instead of a you know toxic yellow zone, which is I've never found particularly pretty. And also I love leaning against trees. So I'd rather have fescue there. So those are a couple of ideas. Sharon, any other ideas? Yeah, those are both great ideas. Like I think about our community garden, which has a fence all around it. And it's really not a problem on the inside of the garden because people are managing right up to the, to the edge. On the outside, it doesn't seem to be much of a problem, but I know, in the past, like a, the city parks department used to spray herbicides and they, they don't anymore. Mowing can be difficult along fence lines. Flaming can work, um, but is, you know, comes with some risks. Um, I think that really the best solution is what I may mentioned in terms of planting, uh, you know, alternatives um, that are, um, you can also use, of course, string trimmers. A lot of cities use string trimmers to deal with these kinds of sites. Um, in the city of Portland, where mulch is used um, as part of the areas with those stormwater facilities, actually, they, um, they do hand weeding in these areas because they definitely don't want to be putting um, herbicides or, you know, that could be toxic right into the stormwater facility where you're basically trying to cleanse your water before it goes down into the river and stream. Um, so they invest in hand weeding in these areas. Um, String trimming is sort of a, a method of hand weeding. It's, you know, it's a little bit quicker. It's not, doesn't pull out the root, um, but it can help you maintain, you know, kind of a, uh, a neat looking area if that's what you need. 